Have you ever wanted to just buy a sneaker and have it fit you perfectly just like that? No breaking in, no uncomfortable first walk, just slip it right in and boom, immediate comfort. That was the idea for one of Nike's shoes that honestly looks like it could have been made in 2050. And while it looks good to some people, others may disagree, but one thing that most people can agree on is that creating this shoe was anything else but smooth sailing. This is the history of the Nike Foam Posit. Originally spearheaded by Eric Avar, the Foam Posit was facing uphill battles from day one. Avar's vision for the Foam Posit was that it was going to be a shoe that would be molded perfectly for the person wearing it, so that the first time you ever placed your foot in that sneaker, you would feel it as it was made just for you. To quote the man himself, quote, there was this notion of, what if you literally just dip your foot in this liquid bath of material and it just sucked around your foot, and what if you could go play basketball in that? End quote. It took Avar and his team four years to research and develop how they would take this task on, because they needed to find a way to create a whole mold at once, so leather and other traditional materials weren't going to cut it. But finally they found the Eureka moment in the material known as polyurethane. Polyurethane is a flexible material used as cushioning in different kinds of furniture and its foam-like qualities makes it great for this exact purpose. This is also where the foam posit gets its name from. However, despite polyurethane being the material that Avar was looking for, Avar now needed to find someone who could create what he wanted. The problem here was that nobody had ever created anything close to what Avar was looking for. Sneakers at this time were mainly created using materials like leather, suede and nubuck, and to create a sneaker with polyurethane was basically a pipe dream. So Avar couldn't use Nike's traditional factories in China, so he had to go out and look for someone who was up for the task. Luckily, Avar found a surprising candidate who could do it, and that was the Korean car company Daewoo. While a surprise for most people, Daewoo actually managed to create what Avar had envisioned, but the results didn't come easy or cheap. To create the mold, Daewoo poured the polyurethane liquid into the mold and then heated it up to between 130 and 175 degrees Fahrenheit. After the upper was constructed, the midsole itself needed to be revamped. To make sure the shoe didn't fall apart on the core, the midsole had to be made about 5 times stronger than any other traditional midsole, which utilized gluing and stitching. All of this ended up reportedly costing Nike $750,000 for the mold alone. And while you're welcome to correct me if I'm wrong, but a single mold only accounts for one size. And if Nike wanted multiple sizes, they would need multiple molds. So it's possible that they had to dish out this type of money multiple times. But alas, they finally had it, the foam posit prototype. The shoe however wouldn't release yet because Nike wanted the shoe to be tried out first before they decided on releasing it. Nike had different contracts with multiple teams in the NCAA including the Arizona Wildcats. It was here that Nike decided to debut their shoe on a basketball court and they chose the player Mike Bibby to do it. Bibby himself was a star player for the team and was an excellent pick for the shoes. However, Nike was concerned since they were risking the shoes being quickly thrown out if the Wildcats didn't win enough games. Luckily, this was not the case. Whether it be due to a good season or the phone posits, the Wildcats kept winning their games and would do so throughout the NCAA championship of 1997. It was during this time that Anthony Penny Hardaway was approached by Nike to talk about what the next step was for his shoe line. Avar reportedly showcased many different shoes to Hardaway, but he dismissed them all, saying that he didn't like the look of any of them. However, Avar still had one shoe left. One that he was a bit dismissive about showing since it was just still a prototype. But he pulled out the foam posits out of his bag and lord and behold, when Hardaway saw the foam posits, he said, that's the shoe I want. Funny enough, according to sources, Avar had originally envisioned the foam posits for Chicago Bulls player Scottie Pippen, but I guess getting snuffed ain't something new to Pippen. I know it's hard to imagine there being other famous basketball players in the 90s besides Jordan, but Hardaway was one of them. So for Avar to have Hardaway choosing the foam posits as his next signature sneaker was a huge deal for the future prospects of the foam posits. 
In the first game of the 1997 NBA playoffs, Hardaway donned the Nike foam posset sneaker in a royal blue colorway, which also spotted his signature one cent logo on the heel. Funny enough, Hardaway actually got in trouble with the shoe since the referees told him that they didn't live up to NBA uniform standards, so Hardaway had to go onto the side, find a sharpie and color his foam posset with stripes of black to make sure that he was allowed to continue playing in them. While Hardaway would have a great game in the shoes, sadly Orlando would be knocked out by the Miami Heat during the playoffs. And while Hardaway didn't go on to win a ring in the shoes, they still live on as one of Nike's biggest achievements in sneaker history. Now let's move on to talk about the shoe itself. The Nike foam posset comes in a foam posset and a fabric upper alongside a durable outsole with parts of carbon fiber. The shoe itself is regarded as being one of the most durable sneakers out there. And while it may have been true back in the day, I can't really speak much about how it is now. And speaking of back in the day, as I mentioned before, this shoe cost Nike a lot of money, but that's the price you pay if you want to be at the forefront when it comes to innovative sneaker technology, especially if it's this revolutionary. And you can definitely see it at the price point at the time. When the Nike foam posits first released, its retail price point was $180. And while this is more or less common today, back then it was outrageous. And when you adjust for inflation, you can see why. However, the foam posset controversy doesn't stop there. For some reason, the foam posits has been the source of many chaotic releases, most notably the Galaxy 1 releases in 2012. This release is said to be one of the top ones when it comes to chaos. We're talking riots, police, and just overall madness due to it being so very limited and people being desperate. People got so desperate in fact that there was one story floating around about a guy who wanted to trade in his car for a pair of foam posits. I mean some people are crazy but honestly it is a good looking pair, not gonna lie. And speaking about good looking pairs, due to the structure of the foam posset upper and the polyurethane material, it makes it able to be used as a canvas for print. This has resulted in some of the most unique and amazing looking collabs that I've ever seen. I mean, they're even rivaling the ones of the Gelite Freeze. And even when you just look at the foam posset in ordinary colors, I mean, they just come out so great in my opinion. Another interesting fact about the shoe is that there is actually two versions of the Nike foam posets. There is the one which is regarded as Hardaway's signature shoe with the one set branding, and then there is the Pro. One of the things that surprised many people back then was that Nike released the one with almost no Nike branding at all, which was very uncommon back then. However, when you look at the Pro, which sports considerably more branding, I think that Nike wanted to create one that was for Hardaway and one that was for them. Nowadays, they would probably just release one and plaster it with swooshes regardless, but looking back at the two, I think it was a nice gesture to give Hardaway a revolutionary shoe that was solely his. And now we're at my favorite part in the video where I get to give out my own opinion on these shoes and, well, I like them. I mean, the whole look of the foam posset seems to divide people in camps where you either hate it or love it, and I'm leaning more towards the latter. I'm not sure about calling it a classic though, I just think that while it does have a unique look, I think it's just that, a unique look. I mean, the model itself doesn't have that timeless feel to it and I think it has also been overshadowed by better choices. I do however think that this shoe deserves respect just due to the fact that just creating a sample of this concept just amazes me and shows what thinking out of the box really can achieve. I wish Nike did more stuff like this instead of releasing newer models with old names and trying to improve stuff that nobody really cares about. I mean, who knows, they have done this before, maybe they just need another Avar to dare take that risk once again. I hope you enjoyed this video, please leave a like if you did so and subscribe if you want to see more. I'm Sneaker Clev and I'll see you in the next video.